urgent message to all Georgia seniors on Amen. Amen. People need the Lord. Thank the cooks. Praise God. As I always do when I speak, I give a brief health nugget. Now, if you're listening in to the, the seminar, the wellness seminar, one of the things I talked about was the herb comfrey. And I talked about how it is a cell proliferator. In other words, it causes the cells to regenerate. It causes the cells to grow. And uh, one popular natural doctor back in the day uh, talked about how a couple of young men were playing with matches, and somehow gasoline got involved, and there was an explosion, and their hands burned down to the bones. Uh, the, doctor, the naturopathic doctor was Dr. Christopher. Many of you may have heard of him. And he talked about how there was two parents one set of parents took the child to the regular way, and they went through the skin grafts and all of these different things. Uh, the other young man was brought to him, and what he put on his hands was a comfrey constituent, not only of comfrey, but he also mixed in wheat germ oil, which is very high in vitamin E, and he mixed in honey, which is good for, uh, to keep down infections. So he had those three, and do you know that the tendons, the skin, everything grew back because of the proliferating capacity of the comfrey. I've also seen that in my practice. I've seen skin grow back, tendons, nerves. So God has put some amazing things on the earth. That's not to say there's not, uh, never time to go the regular way. Sometimes there's a, a time to go to the hospital. But uh, there's also ways that that should be the alternative and not the primary. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity to open your words. We ask for the Holy Spirit. Father, if there's any evil influences, demonic powers that will come in, we ask that you would drive them out. I ask if there's anything in my heart that would hinder your spirit working through me, please forgive me and cause your people only to hear you and not me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brace for impact. On January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 was a domestic route from New York City's LaGuardia Airport to Charlotte, North Carolina. The flight was cleared for takeoff from runway four at LaGuardia at 3.24 p.m. Eastern. There were 150 passengers and five crew members, the captain, the first officer, and three flight attendants on board. Suddenly, at almost 3,000 feet on its initial ascent, to 15,000 feet, a flock of geese fly into the plane and into the engines. The impact into the engines caused both engines to lose all power or thrust. The pilot in command was 57-year-old Captain Chesley B. Sully Sullenberger. He took control of the air aircraft from First Officer Jeffrey B. Skiles as Skiles began going through the emergency protocols. This flight started off just like every other flight that I have flown for the past 42 years for like the first 90 seconds or two minutes, says the captain. After the birds destroyed the engines and the pilots realized they had no engine thrust, they immediately realized that they had a serious problem. The passengers reported hearing a loud sound and then nothing at all. Then smoke began to fill the plane. They sit and wait to hear something from the pilot. There was silence for a long time. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, the captain radios in, Mayday, 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 Cactus 1549 hit birds. 
the captain resorts to rule commandment number one, maintain aircraft control. Crew had to come up with a plan to save the aircraft in about 30 seconds. Very little margin for error. Controller, do you want to land 1913? Captain, we're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. Controller, runaway three is open. Captain, unable. Captain, anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro. Controller, you want to try to go to Teterboro? Captain, yes. Runaway one at Teterboro is approved. Controller, OK, flight 1549. Turn right, 280, you can land. Runaway one at Teterboro. Captain, we can't do it. Controller, OK, which runaway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. Controller, I'm sorry. Say again, Cactus. Plane is descending at 1,000 to 1,500 feet per minute. After a while, the plane drops off the radar. One of the passengers says, you could have heard a pin drop at this point. No one was saying anything. I'm looking out the window, and you can see the skyline of New York City. It's getting lower and lower. So we had that time. We knew we were going to end up in the water. Suddenly, a voice came over the intercom. This is the captain. Brace for impact. The name of this message, Brace for Impact. Amen. And it's coming from your captain. Amen. Our country shall, not might, not maybe, shall repudiate every principle of this Constitution as a Protestant and a Republican government. That means a Republican government means a nation or a government that's run by law. Amen? Amen? Protestant means to protest, to protest the encroachments of the Roman Catholic system and the daughters associated with it. Now, when I was putting this together, Lord impressed me to impress upon the people. Now, let me back up for a moment. Whenever I have a sermon, first of all, I always pray what to preach on. Then I pray for myself. Then I pray for those who are going to come or who may not be planning to come, but they need to hear it. And when I'm putting the message together, I'm praying, Lord, what should I use next? What scripture should I put next? What quote should I put next? So just to show you, just to tell you, that's how I prepare messages. And when I was preparing this message, the Lord says, impress upon the people the spiritual side of what's going on on a physical level. Impress upon the people the spiritual side of what's going on on a physical level, because sometimes we don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. And sometimes we get caught up on what we can see and we forget what we cannot see. Therefore, let's go, if you would, to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, where are we going to? Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12. Popular text. Remember, we have to, this has to become real to us. It can't just be in the book. It has to become real to us. Say amen when you get there. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Did he say the wiles of man? Against the wiles of the devil. Then he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now what I want to try to do I'm trying to bring this in. I'm trying to bring three elements in together. I'm going to try to bring in where we are and try to help us see how these things manifest on a physical level while at the same time helping us to understand the spiritual side of it. And the great dragon. Now we have that backdrop, right? Spiritual wickedness in high places. But then in Revelation, the Bible comes back and gives us some more information. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, 
And who will cast out with him? So it's not just him. Although we can't see them, that doesn't mean they're not there. Amen? Amen. Now, when you get into deep work, into the spiritual work, you start doing evangelism, you start going to certain areas, you will see manifestations of the enemy. You will see things that you don't believe exist come to to appearance. Therefore, rejoice, ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. For why? He knows that he has but a short time. Do you know we have but a short time? That means he believes the scripture. He believes the scripture because the scripture tells he only only has a short time. Another example of spiritualism manifested on a physical level. We go back to Egypt. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents, but Abraham's rod swallowed up their rods. Now think about this. Are we prepared to see this type of magic when Satan is trying to bring the whole world under his control? Are we prepared for the doors to open and a person that we thought was dead, that we know is dead, to walk in through the walls, through the doors? Are we prepared to see that? Are we? And they say, touch me, feel me, I'm real. Are we prepared for that? Could the veil be lifted from before our eyes? We should see evil angels employing all their arts to deceive and to destroy. The spirit of prophecy tells us that every time we come together like this, every time we come together at a prayer meeting, at a service, she says there are evil angels walking up and down the aisles to distract our minds. She also says there's righteous angels also trying to get our attention to pay attention. Don't go to sleep. Wake up. Don't sleep during the sermon. No one's sleeping right now, but I'm just saying. The end is very near, said the prophet of the Lord. God's people should be preparing for what is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise, great for impact. The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open up before us, open upon us. It is often, this is my favorite part, it is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. Not this time. You know how sometimes something is happening and you say, oh, things are going to mess up and you're worried about it and then it happens. It's not as bad as you thought. Not this time. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal, the prophet says. So even when we read it in the scripture, even when we read in Revelation what's going to happen, even when we read in the great controversy, she says that really can't, even though God tells us, it can't reach the total, it can't grasp it when you actually have to experience. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle we are not entering. A battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. But remember who's behind it. Satan and his angels. The unseen is illustrated by the seen. Let that sink in. The unseen is illustrated by what we can see. So, Throughout Christendom, let's back up. Now, a, a, a while back I gave a message called, <clears throat> they have turned the world upside down. I would have took a couple of slides from that to remind us. Now remember, she just told us that the final, the final battle is basically what is the continuation of the completion of the battle, which took place that started way back. The controversy between God and Satan, between God's laws and Satan's laws, or his precepts. And remember, remember, that which is seen, there's something behind that which is unseen. Now, if you go back in history, throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. To accomplish what destruction? The destruction of Protestantism. Did we not just read that every principle of Protestantism 
will be repudiated? Who's behind this? Satan. Who's, who's he working through? The first triumph of Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Pastor, elder, president, senator. No disguise too difficult for them to assume. Seventh-day Adventist member, teacher. It was their study aim to secure wealth and power. To do what? Their study aim to secure wealth and power, and we look up and love those who have wealth and power, don't we? We almost worship those who have wealth and power. To be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism. That means the overthrow of America. Because one of the principles of the foundation of America is Protestantism. And the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor. Just because you do good and merciful works does not necessarily mean that we're righteous. And that's what we have to understand. That's why I wanted to put and press upon the spiritual side. We have to know Jesus or we're not going to stand. When you see what's coming, there's no way to stand unless we're locked in with Jesus. And how do we do that? By having that walk with him every day, Amen. praying, spending time with the Lord every day, yeah. reaching out, helping to save souls, Bible study, our personal devotion. Hearing sermons is not going to be enough. Doing Bible studies and prayer meetings is not going to be enough. We have to have personal time with Jesus. Amen. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state. Hmm. Under various disguises, they worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be councils of kings and doing what? Shaping the policies of nations. Are we understanding what's going on here? And they use sorcery to do it. They have rituals, we're going to go into, they have ritualistic practices that allow them to communicate with evil spirits. And those evil spirits come down and help them, take, help them bring about the things that they want to bring about. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. By their sorceries was all nations deceived. Now, give an example. Now let's step over to the, to the, the practical side and look at how some of this was done. Adam Westphal. Anybody ever heard of Adam, Adam Westphal? Yeah. Ever heard of him? Yeah. He was a Jesuit, a trained Jesuit. The founder of the Illuminati. On May 1st, 1776. When? Remember that date. May 1st, 1776. 1776. Did something else happen in 1776? Okay, remember that. May 1st, 1776, Johann Adam Westphal found the Illuminati in the electorate of Bavaria, which is in Germany. He adopted the name of Brother Spartacus within the order. The actual character of the society was an elaborate network of spies and counter spies. Each isolated cell of initiates reported to a superior whom they did not know, a party structure that was effectively adopted by some later groups. White Fault was initiated into the Masonic Lodge at Munich in 1777. His project was that of illumination, enlightening the understanding by the sign of reason, which will dispel the clouds of superstition and of prejudice. He used Freemasonry to recruit for his, his own quasi-Masonic society with the goal of perfecting human nature. Presenting their own system as pure Masonry, White Fault and Adolf Nick, who organized his ritual structure, greatly expanded the secret organization. They also sought out the clergy 
and devised a plan to recruit gullible and ignorant members of the, of the clergy. One letter revealed how they would introduce this, quote, new Jesus who had a secret meaning to hidden Christianity. They basically set up what they call Christian degrees within the Illuminati. Quote, White Fault was thrilled to discover that so-called Christian pa priests, pastors, and other church leaders flocked to his secret society. He even inv invented an advanced priest degree. And one correspondent, he wrote to a friend saying the following, you cannot imagine that consideration and what consideration and sensation our priest degree is arousing. The most wonderful thing is that great Protestant and Reformed theologians who belong to Illuminism still believe that the religious teaching imparted in it contains the true and genuine spirit of the Christian religion. So they said, how are you into witchcraft? Illuminati, and you still, and you're a significant member, a preacher, and you believe that you're an Illuminati, but you're still a Christian. He went on to explain that we are, uh, he said, oh, men of what cannot you be persuaded? I never thought I should become the founder of a new religion. He went on to explain that we will be able to provide priests and clergy for all Bavaria. He said they would be given the choice assignments in seminaries and universities eventually. He predicted that teaching the reason or the worship of Lucifer would be spread worldwide. So we're going to train them. We're going to give them the top spots in seminaries and universities to preach and spread witchcraft, our doctrine of reason. Now, I brought this up before, but I want to look at that a little closer. A letter by a seminarian to the dean of Andrew. This happened in 2008. How can this be? You notice what he just said, right? How can this be? A letter by a seminarian to the dean of the Andrews University Seminary about the invitation of two Jesuit priests to speak at the seminary. Now, we saw this something happened recently, and people cried out in the church. They said, hey, what are you guys doing? And it's from time to time, but this is not new. This has been going on for a while. So think about the mindset of the people who would invite Jesuits to come in and speak to our future pastors. Now, he's a seminarian, so he wrote this letter. He said, hey, he said, subject regarding Jesuits at the seminary last week, April 14th, 2008. That's what he said, right? I am writing this letter to you to express my deep concern for the state of affairs in our seminary. A week ago, this our seminary opened the chapel for two Jesuit trained priests to pound the virtue of Catholic missions in the South American and South American Asia. For about eight hours, they shared with seminary students and faculty their perspective of missions and even hinted at our involvement with their mission to win the world under nondescript Christianity. He went on to say, while attending there, I was absolutely astounded how many obsequiously smi smiled and amend for these two gentlemen as they smoothed over the rather gruesome and skull-druggerous practice of their church to, to subjugate the new world and Asia. He says that he even attempted to, 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 to protest, and he was pretty much shut down. So even these people, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, smiled as these Jesuit priests came in. And the ideas and the concepts that they were teaching and preaching, they found them acceptable. to the law, and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen? Amen. Remember, what, remember what they said and remember what we see. Remember what they said and remember what we see. They said, we're going to put our people in. We're going to make sure they get into the top spots. Right? We must consider, he went on to say, how we can begin to work under another form. If only the aim is achieved, it does not matter under what cover the work takes place, and a cover is always necessary. For in concealment lies a great part of our strength. For this reason, we must always cover ourselves with the name of another society. The lodges that are under Freemasonry are, in the meantime, the most suitable cloak for our purpose, because the world is already accustomed to expect nothing great from them 
which merits attention. As in the spiritual order of the Roman church, religion was, alas, only a pretense. Now, remember last time I talked to you about Dr. Alberto Rivera, right? He was, a high, he, was, he was a Jesuit under extreme oath and induction that, uh, that defected. Now, remember, all Jesuits are not under extreme oath and induction. You have some who are under extreme oath and induction. Those are the ones that infiltrate and do certain different things. And so, remember, he was one. He was one of the highest ranking Jesuits that ever come out. And he says, I hated Protestants. I believed that they were our deadliest enemies. That's when they put me into espionage work to infiltrate and to destroy their churches. It's interesting when you go back and read the history on him, when he came out, although he had all these documentation that he was a priest, he had people who knew him. Rome came out and said, oh, he was never a priest. He just, nah, nah, that's not true. Of course they're going to say that. Hey, you see, you see his documentation there. You see his pictures. You see, you see his, he's there. He says, as years went by, I would infiltrate hundreds of churches and organizations. Do you realize that these, again, these people, he talks about how he was invited to a, a meeting in, I forget where it was, in Spain, up in the mountains, and he said they were, they were, they were, they were, they were basically having a, a seance, and how they were, you know, calling up evil spirits. Again, these people are, he, are using the dark side, wicked powers in high places, to bring about the New World Order, the Great Reset. And they used to call it the New World Order, now they call it the Great Reset. It's the same thing, different packaging. He goes on to say, the first Protestant groups they moved on were the Seventh-day Adventists. Hmm. This is what he says. He said, the first Protestant groups that they moved on were the Seventh-day Adventists and the full gospel businessmen, then into the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, etc., until they were all infiltrated, including the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses. All the seminaries, universities, and colleges were next. The Jesuits directed Catholic News Action, Legion of Mary, and Knights of Columbus who pulled it off. Now these groups are silent about Rome or claim that the Roman system is a Christian church. Is that true? We don't hear anymore, though, right? If you go back and read some of our, our, I just look at us for a minute. Look at our earliest publications. If you go back and read back in 18, 19, especially when Ellen White was still alive, and then look at our publications today. It's not the same. Let me ask you a question. I know many of us went to different churches. How many times have you gone to our churches and the pastors have preached and exposed? Of course, Jesus is the, is the center, of course. But you almost can't hear it anymore. So then that means that these groups are silent about Rome? Or they claim that Rome is changed, that she's a Christian church? He says, almost all Protestant pastors are afraid to speak out against Rome. If they did, he says, those planted in their churches would attack them on demand. I told you it's real. See, we have to understand the spiritual side, but we need to understand, though, that it comes over and it's, 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 it's manifested on the physical as well. Ellen White tells us in the Desire of Ages that when Jesus was, when, they, when, when Paula asked, should I crucify him? She says, there was demons also in human form in the crowd. And even they said, yes, crucify him. The prophet says, here's what we have to understand. We have to understand, a lot of people were surprised and discombobulated when, the, when, when uh, Dr. Conrad Vine, uh, he got what he got, right? Yes. Why were we, why were we surprised? Sure. Why? We have to understand that not everybody that's in the church is a Christian. That's right. Amen? That's right. We have to be reconverted every day. Amen. We have to be reconverted every day or we would do anything. I'm telling you. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? That means that you don't even know what you would do but for the grace of God on our hearts. 
we have far more. Now, even though we're talking about the Jesuits, but now maybe she's telling us this because she knew that, listen, there was going to come, become changes. We're going to be infiltrated. Things are going to go. We have far more to fear from within than from without. Think about that. This she tells us the hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than even from the world. Then she tells us why. The unbelief indulged. Did you believe the spirit of prophecy? Did you believe the health message? Did you believe the Sabbath? The state of the dead? Do you believe that we have to live a Christian life to be saved? Do you believe that with Christ dwelling in us, we can live on earth without sinning? Do you believe that? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished. What does it do? It encourages the presence, now back to the spiritual side, of evil angels and opens the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices in your life and in the church. Think about that. She said it encourages the presence of evil angels. And then we wonder why they're backing it up in the church. There must be a refining, winnowing process in every church, for there are among us wicked men who do not love the truth or honor God. You see why uh, Dr. Vine got so much uh, 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 blowback? Because there are men in the church who do not love the truth, nor do they honor God. Therefore, she said, there must be a winnowing process in every church. Every seven day Adventist church, there's going to be a shaking. Everyone. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Just because a man has a particular position does not make him holy. We need to understand that. If you read the spirit of prophecy, she tells you that over and over and over again. She says a man who is a dictator, she said he needs to be moved from away. He don't need to be a pastor, she says. A man who is a dictator, if you got a pastor who's a dictator, a leader who's a dictator, she says, if he's a dictator, move him out. She said, not only will he's doing damage to himself, but he's doing damage to the church. She tells you, position does not make the man. She tells you, just because you have a position does not make you holy. Amen? Just because I'm Elder Henry don't make me holy. That's right, the fruit. Elder, that don't mean anything if I'm not living the life. Amen? What does that mean? It don't mean anything. The title don't mean anything. And so, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, in the Jesuit kind of Reformation, you see the things that have come out and spread throughout. You know, even with us, you had the purpose driven life, and then the purpose driven church, then Saddleback, then Willow Creek, then the emerging church. All this nonsense is coming in. What did, it, what, what, did, what did he say? He says, I infiltrated hundreds of churches. We moved on the, on the universities, on the colleges, on the schools. And then we can get, it's like a virus. We can get your own ministers to reproduce our doctrine to your people. This is why we must support those ministers, elders, whoever, that stand up for truth. Yep. Amen. Amen. None dare call it apostasy. Saddleback Willow Creek, secular worship services or styles, lowering or rationalizing the Bible standards, minimizing and, understand and undermining uh, the, the spirit of prophecy, excusing and tolerating apostate pastors and leaders, ignoring the health message, accepting doctrines and practices from other churches and introducing them into our churches. Now, not, there's not a one of us in here can say that that's not true. It's true. Does that mean that, some, that all these people are lost? No. There, there are people that are still going to be saved because God is going to be able to reach them. It's not that, as Ellen White said, she says men who, she put it this way, she says men who introduce error, she said they are to be opposed, not because they're bad men necessarily, but they have, you have to stop the error. What's the brother's name? Uh, uh, I tried to, at my other church, I, I warned the brothers and sisters against him. Oh, what's the guy's name? He always does the prophecies. Uh, mm -mm. I can't remember his name right now. He makes these grandiose prophecies. He has a lot of great stories. Uh, 
David Gates. David Gates. And when he had his prophecy, I told the brothers and sisters, I said, listen, I don't know Brother Gates. He seemed like a nice guy. I said, but what he's saying here is error. Don't listen to it. It's not going to happen. I said, I know it's not going to happen because the spirit of prophecy said there's no more prophecies based on time. So I believe the spirit of prophecy. So I can say with great certainty that what he's saying is not going to happen. I like him. I don't know the man personally, but when I see him, I like him. But he can't. Just because we like him doesn't mean that what he's saying is true. Sure enough, I mean, it was, there was people who, was believe, people who knew the president of the truth. They thought, oh, yeah, David Gates. I said, no, we understand that. But look at what inspiration says. Amen? And the time came and passed. And they came back, well, yeah, it didn't happen. We knew. Believe the prophet. Believe the prophet. There was a series called The Purge. There was a movie series. Now, a lot of y'all are quiet. I know some of y'all haven't watched movies. Don't play. <laughs> Do not play. <laughs> Don't play. There was a series called The Purge. And uh, I don't know all the details specifically. I have an idea of some of it, a lot of it. Uh, but basically, but, but you have to understand this. The powers that be were oftentimes put into movies because they control, I'm going to hit that, they control the media. So a lot of times they were put into movies what they are planning to do. It's called predictive programming. It's a form of witchcraft. And so a lot of times they were put into movies what they are planning to do. People always talk about The Simpsons and all those different things, right? Now, The Purge. The concept was that one night a year, one night a year, you go out and you could kill as many people as you want. It brought to my mind what Satan wants to do, more than likely during the, during the great time of trouble. And there would be so much turmoil. Of course, the, the Adventists would be, those faithful Adventists would be the targets. But because as, as, the, as the earth becomes to unravel, things are going to get really, really bad. Nobody will be safe. And so you can see how, remember, we, remember we're dealing with people who, have, who are having intercourse with demons and evil spirits, and, they, and some of these people invest, are infested like, 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 like parasites with demons. And so you got to remember, and some of them are leaders in positions of leadership in the government, and so they're bringing about these things. And so we have to understand, and as you can see there, it says, uh, from the advertisement, it says, Blessed be the new founding fathers for letting us purge and cleanse our souls. Blessed be America, a nation reborn. Every principle of our Constitution will be repudiated. A nation reborn. So they're telling you what they're going to do. They're telling us. That's why we have to draw closer and closer to Jesus. There's nothing that, that's going to help us stand. Here's another guy, very, very high-level ranking Mason. In fact, one of his books was, was that no one could ever could read it back in the day, but Masons. They were not allowed to any, let anyone read it because it had in it its plans for the country and for the world. Here's what he says, Manly P. Hall. According to Manly P. Hall, the third, third degree Scottish Rite Freemason, right, he writes in his book, The Secret Destiny of America, that the United States of America was created by a network of Masons and other related secret societies that something referred to as the Order of the Quest. According to Hall, now again, he's a very high-ranking high ranking Mason. According to Hall, the Secret Alliance has one essential mission, to deliver a one-world government based in democracy and philosophy, which was also a dream and aspiration of the Greeks, first credited to Plato. That would explain why the city of D.C. is laid out in a Masonic, in Masonic uh, way. This would explain it. So the city of D.C., there's also other, <clears throat> other cities have certain layouts. And the reason, if you listen to them, why they lay it out this way, because they are high-level occultists. They believe when you lay things out this way that it would encourage the presence of evil and of demons. So that's why they use these, these different uh, symbols. So they lay the entire city out. Uh, you have the pentagram, which is considered the most wicked uh, 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 symbol, one of the most wicked symbols in black magic. And then you have the goat over here down at the bottom. So they, they've laid it out in such a way the city of D.C. in such a way that they can call in evil forces. It, it helps them call in evil forces. So they're running rituals on a, they're running rituals on a, on a countrywide and worldwide level to br help bring about the Great Reset or the New World Order. He goes on to say, ceremony magic is the ancient order of invoking and controlling spirits 
by scientific application of certain formulae. That's what he says. He wouldn't know because he's been into it. A magician enveloped in sanctified vestments and carrying a wand inscribed with hieroglyphic figures could, by the power vested in certain words and symbols, control the invisible inhabitants of the elements and of the astral world, so they think. While the elaborate ceremony of magic antiquity was not necessarily evil, you notice, you notice they don't see it as evil, there arose from its, from its perversion several false schools of sorcery or black magic. Now remember, this is supposed to be read only by his masons and by the masons and other ones in these secret societies. He goes on to say, many magician has lost his life as a result of opening a way whereby sub-mundane creatures could become active participants participant in his affairs. See, people think this stuff is just a joke. We just read in the very beginning, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so he's saying, listen, these magicians, remember a lot of these people in these Masonic and in, in these, in these, the, the, the Illuminati, they are practicing black magic. They're running rituals. So they're opening portals to bring in power to help them bring about what they want to bring about. Behind them, you have the Jesuits behind the Illuminati. They're behind all the secret society. They're the tip top. That's why you would notice when world leaders meet with the Pope, you notice they always wear dark colors and he wears white. Because in black magic, the inferior must wear a darker color when it meets his superior. By means of the secret process of ceremony of magic, it is possible to con contact these, evil, these invisible creatures and gain their help in some human undertaking. All right? He goes on to say, it is possible to make contract with spirits whereby the magician becomes for a stipulated time the master of an elemental being. It is, in its various branches, the black art includes nearly all forms of ceremonial magic, necromancy, witchcraft, sorcery, and vampirism. Under the same general heading are also included mesmerism and hypnotism, except when used for medical purposes. Even then, you can't use that. And even then, there is an element of risk for all concerned. Now remember, he was writing for his own people. For when I say his own people, those who practice black magic and may sound in order, these, these secret societies. And so think about that for a minute. When we stop and we think about it, these people believe wholeheartedly in their supernatural power. Do we believe in access to our supernatural power? Our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot match human power with supernatural power. We cannot deal with them playing games. They are serious. They mean business. And so we need to mean business as well. Amen? Amen. The demon Mephistopheles shown being conjured up by a magician in Masonic and in Masonic Scotland, in third, third degree, Illuminatus, Manly P. Hall's 1928 occult book, classic, Secret Teachings of All Ages, bears a remarkable resemblance to Yoda, the wise ascendant master of the Star Wars saga. Remember I told you they also control the media and the movie industry, right? So you notice he actually puts this in his book. I told you he's a magician. When, he, when he's talking to his, uh, when he's showing what, what type of evil spirits are supposed to come up when they do their, when they do their rituals. In this book, he has, he has what the evil spirit is supposed to look like so that when they do their ritual, they'll know when the right one pops up. And so, but you will notice that, ah, uh, what happened? Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, you will notice that uh, the little, the, 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 the little, thing that, that pops up, it looks very similar to Yoda from the Star Wars uh, 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 series. You see what I'm saying? Listen, if you ever, what was that movie back uh, uh, with Mel Gibson played, he played Jesus? The Passion of the Christ. Did you know that they said, he said, even himself he said it, that they knew that most Christians, a lot of people would not go to a Catholic ritual. So what they did was they took the Catholic ritual and they put it in a movie called the four, and this ritual is called the 14 Stations of the Christ. And so you go and you watch the movie and each station was part of the ritual. So when you watched it, you think you're just watching the movie, you actually participate in the ritual. That's what, that's, that's what they said, that's what he said. And so you see he's watching Star Wars and you see this little Yoda creature not understanding that when they go in, that he's actually a, a, a replica of a demon that they call up. And you also notice in this picture here, at the top left, you see Baphomet. And I told you today that they control entertainment. 
So again, you have to understand that, and I, I was trying to tie everything together to show that the unseen power of the enemy, he's serious about it. He's in political areas, entertainment, the churches, everything, to help us understand why we have to be serious about our relationship with Jesus. Five corporations control virtually all 14,000 radio stations in America, all 5,000 television stations, all of the billboards, and most of the large internet content providers, according to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Think about that. A lot of you are going to go out and be voting here pretty soon, right? <laughs> Remember, a good part of your, of your ideology, who you see and who you want to vote for, has been shaped by the media. A lot of things you think is your own thoughts, your mind has actually been shaped by the media. Much of what you see in society, and especially when it comes from official sources, is fabricated. The powers that be have literally engineered a false reality matrix of ideas and beliefs that have become the social and political realities of millions and millions, and most do not realize that these fairy tales were created and fed to them, and thus they would defend them with great tenacity, defending myths which actually appear to be true and they just miss. Good example. How you were deceived with fake news. Reporter asked Bush, too, second Bush, about video news releases, prepackaged news stories used by his administration that were produced by the government and sent to TV stations with no disclaimer that they were produced by the government. Bush responds that there is justice, that there is a Justice Department opinion that says these pieces are okay as long as they are based on facts and not advocacy. So your administration is producing fake news, essentially. And being, no one's being told, and it's being, that's government. They're, they're running, they're, 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 they're feeding the people whatever they're feeding them. And the reporter asked him about it. He's like, well, well, you know, you should at least say that this is, you know, oh, no, it don't, it don't really matter. The Justice Department has determined that it's okay. But who runs the Justice Department? Project Mockingbird, 1975, intelligence hearing revealed the CIA had agents essentially throughout the media, press, both in the U.S. and around the world. Listen, the Bible shows us that the, that the control of the world is going to be complete. When we're order, when we're government, right? When we're religion. And the, God tells us in Revelation, there's only going to be a small group of people it's going to stand. This came out this week. Let me tell you about how they're, they're messing with the news. This came out this week. ABC station mistakenly aired the election result declaring Harris winner of Keith Swing State. <laughs> so now, wait, I, I, I think I said, hold on, wait a minute. And they try to come out and start explaining with this and that, and they're like, no, 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 hold up. What's going on behind the scenes? So the election hasn't taken place yet, but you already has, have the result for the state, the swing state in Philadelphia. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. You need to understand. That's why people get worked up and we're mad at one another and fighting one another. Listen. Your votes, it's, 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 it's already determined. I say pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Amen. 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 Now, and, and I'm running out of time, I know, so I need to, I need to hurry up. I don't know how much time I have left, but I, I uh, now, uh, now remember this. Again, I, I want you to understand how they're using witchcraft and, and, and whatnot to go over into the, to control the political arena, the, the religious arena, every arena. And these people, again, we need to understand that they've created a false reality for most of us. So now, don't miss the all seeing eye on CBS, okay? You notice it said, don't miss the all seeing eye on CBS. See CBS? All seeing eye, don't miss that. Now, it's interesting that. In 19, you track, uh, they were in track down with an American Western series that ran from 1957 to 1959. Remember what I told you about how they prepared the mind? It featured a character named Walter Trump, 
uh, and in a, in a 1958 episode called End of the World, this shows Trump was a con artist who said he, he could prevent the end of the world by building a wall. Walter Trump, Walter Trump proposed wall was meant to ward off a supposed, quote, cosmic explosion. Uh, he says, Trump, I am the only one, trust me, I can build a wall around your home that nothing will penetrate. One person in the crowd said, what do we do? How can we save ourselves? And he said, Trump says, you, you, you asked how do you build that wall. You asked, I'm here to tell you. Now, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the series, it says, the Trump in track down even threatens to sue Texas Ranger Abby Gilman for saying bad things about him. And finally, in this, in this episode, Trump was arrested. Was Trump arrested? Yeah. So remember, predictive programming. A man who said Trump, who said I can build a wall, right? To protect you, right? I mean, think about that. Are they following a script? Remember that? In 2000, the Simpsons portrayed Trump as the president. We told you. It's strike, here's a striking example. Now, this is a, just to show you how magic is used in the media. It says, this is an ad uh, in 2013. The ad begins with a guy admiring a billboard featuring the car in question. It was a Mercedes Benz. All of a sudden, the devil then pops up and tells him, make a deal with me, kid, and you can have the car and everything that goes along with it. The guy takes the pen and then has a vision of what would happen if he made a deal with the, quote, the devil. According to the ad, this is what happens when you sell your soul. It starts off with him becoming a celebrity and dating a current beautiful and famous woman at the time, Kate Upton was her name. And then you see him dancing with Usher. It says he, he being famous as a result of selling his soul gets to hang out and party with some of the mega stars of the music industry like Usher. You see, notice that hourglass, that symbol in the background, right? Don't miss that. The ad relays the reality that you become the man or woman of applicable. Your face is featured on magazine covers. You also drive a nice car, have girls running after you, and you become a race car champ. Seemed like in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, somebody came to Jesus and showed him all the glories of the world and said, bow down and worship me, and I give you all of this. The ad switches back from the vision to the offer of the contract. The seal on the contract is the reverse of the ancient Chiroi symbol that was adopted by the Catholic Church as a symbol of Christ. You see it. And this is a, they even played this commercial during the Super Bowl, too. So think about it. They're, what they're doing is they're running a ritual. They're running a worldwide ritual through the media. That's what this is. Understand. So he says, the small hourglass shape somewhere at the left of the inverted P is similar to the illuminated sign that was between Usher and the guy. By looking close at the devil's ring, you notice that the one on top is clearly Masonic. It's a Masonic symbol. Why would this specific symbol be there? It refers to a real powerful secret society. There are many symbolic messages in this short commercial. There is fire on the 13th of the 2013 as the commercial ends. They're running a ritual. 13 is possibly the most important number in Masonic and occult numerology. It is specifically highlighted. This signals who is, being, who is behind the ad, and it also reinforces the ritual. That's why I want you to see the spiritual side of things. Everything is not just what you see. Remember, we, the first, we started off where we were saying spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, behind, while all this is going on, the music in the background is this song from the Rolling Stones. So now you've got the visual and the auditory going on. And in the song you're hearing, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year, stole many a man's soul and faith. And I was, around, I, I, I was around when Jesus had his moment of doubt and pain made sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. 
I stuck around St. Petersburg when I thought it was a time for a change. Killed the Tsar and his ministers, and, and his ministers, and, and Anastasia screamed in vain. I rode a tank, held a general's rank, when the Blitz Creek raged and the body stank. Pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name. But what's confusing you? It's just the nature of my game. Just call me Lucifer because I'm in need of some restraint. So if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy, and some taste. Use all your well-earned politeness, or I'll lay your soul to waste. Now, while the commercial was going, this is the music playing in the background. That is a ritual. By her sorceries. Remember, Rome, everything's come from her, from the Jesuits to the secret societies, spread out. So that goes. The Jesuits, they oversee all secret societies. And all these other organizations like the CFR and all these different, the Trilateral Commission, all those fall underneath it, all of them. Now, the act of sorcery that set the stage was September 11th. That was, the, that was an act of sorcery that actually shifted a lot of what would be the basis of shifting a lot of our civil liberties. Satanists always place, Satan, Satanists always place great power in numbers, especially the black magic Satanists. Satanists believe that a carefully planned event must be carried out according to the correct numbers or it may not be successful. They go to great lengths to make an event occur, uh, an event uh, should be occurred to the correct numbers, according to the correct numbers. So if you look at 9-11 again, if you understand this, these rituals, 9-11 was run by rituals. It was a sacrifice. That's why it was done by fire. Remember in the Bible how they would burn, they would sacrifice, they would throw the kids? Remember, these are the same people. It's the same religion. It's the ancient religion coming up. Remember, the, the papacy took that same old religion, put Christian words and terms on it, and it's the same religion. And so in order to keep the same power, the, the, the spiritual power, they have to do what the evil spirits want them to do. So the first 11 is formed by the day on which this tragedy occurred, September 11th. Remember, they, number 11 is a, a number that they, they, them, to them has great power, mystic power. The second, and this, I'm not going to go through all of them, I don't have the time, but there's a lot of 11s. But the second 11 is formed by adding a ninth month, September, and the date, 1 plus 1, forming 11. Again, that's how they do it. The third 11 is formed by the airplane number that first crashed into the World Trade Number. That plane was American Airlines Flight Number 11. The fourth 11 is formed by the airplane number that crashed into the Pentagon. The plane was, a, was United Airlines Flight Number 77, 11 by 7. Remember, they also go by the, the, the multiples of the number. So when they're doing the rituals, they go by the number itself or multiples of the number. Uh, the fifth 11 is formed by the North Twin Tower of the World Trade Center, was 110 stories tall, 11 by 10. The sixth 11 is formed by the South Twin Tower of the World Trade Center, was 110 stories, 11 by 10. The architecture of the Twin Towers, they look like a number 11, right? They was built purposely for that reason. It looked like a number 11. Uh, 11 years to the day, on September 11, 1990, President George Bush delivered a speech to the Congress entitled, Moving Toward a New World Order. Precisely 11 years to the day after President Bush delivered this speech praising New World Order, the attack occurred. To the day. You think that was by surprise? <sighs> Pope Francis, now think about it. Remember I said that? Now after that, we say everything sped up. <laughs> Next thing you know, and I'm jumping forward. Next thing you know, Pope Francis has been invited by House Speaker John Boehner to speak to a joint session of Congress. Now, remember, when he came in, he was a Jesuit pope, right? Before him, the first pope that ever stepped down in 500 years, right? He comes in, he's the first, first Jesuit pope. He was in, now at the time, John Boehner was the head, I think he was the Speaker, for the, speaker of the House. That's the third ranking member of the Congress. President. Vice President, Speaker of the House. Also, the leader of the Democrats at the time was Nancy Pelosi. Both her and Boehner were Roman Catholics. Okay? So, understand, so Pope Francis has been invited by, has been invited by House Speaker John Boehner to speak to a joint session of Congress. Boehner extended the, the formal invitation today in a letter to the Vatican on the one-year anniversary of his papacy, saying that Holy Father has awakened hearts on every continent. Uh, Boehner, a Catholic, said the Pope's message challenged people of all faiths, ideologies, and political parties. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, also a Catholic, joined the speaker in his invitation. And that's the, actually the official letter. It's interesting, he says, 
with every good wish to your holiness, I am sincerely yours. So you got the third ranking member in a Protestant nation. In a Protestant nation. Supposedly, a Protestant nation. Now again, we understand not everybody in the Roman Catholic Church is lost. Not some people there are true Christians. They're true Christians to some of us. That's why you have a call out. That's why people are going to be called out of Babylon. They're going to be called out of other, area, other areas. And some of us might be lost. But the system, the system is set up. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience, which had been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyal to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? There was a time, she says. I'm trying to close this off. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the danger to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. See, people are quiet until it messes with their liberty. When you start losing your civil liberties and your religious liberties, then you'll be looking crazy because you didn't say anything. Don't sit back and let it go and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And then you lose, you lose uh, your civil and religious liberty. Listen to what the prophet says. She says the people, the people need to be aroused to resist the advances. Does, 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 does that mean it needs to be done? They need to be aroused to, re, to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to both civil and religious liberty. We shall soon see and feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Now, as I, this right here, I want to get, this, was, this came out during this, during, this happened during the Obama presidency. So remember, don't, like he said earlier, don't think, it's not about Republicans and Democrats. You've been conditioned to believe it's about that. Trust me. We've been looking at how they use the media, how they use witchcraft. Don't believe that because they say it. People, we're mad at one another because, oh, he, he, he's back in Trump. Oh, they're, they're back in Hillary. Oh, you black and you back in Trump. Oh, you white. Listen, all that means nothing. The government under Obama had kill lists for American citizens even. Kill this. Satan's preparing that for you and I. It's really for us. It's really, really for us at the end. It's really for us. Who is not going to bend? Uh, this was an internal, this was internal, internal um, information that showed that even U.S. citizens could be targeted and killed. Think about that. In a CNN interview about the Boston bombings and investigations, a former FBI counterterrorism agent admitted a startling fact. What did he say? He says, all digital communications are recorded and stored. All of them, all phone calls, all emails, and all social media interactions. According to him, there is definitely a war of retracing and listening, a way of retracing and listening to any phone call made on U.S. soil. All of them. So if you got a side chick or a side guy, <laughs> and, and they stand up, and, you, and, and, you're, on, and you're on the, uh, oh, I'm a Christian. And they say, well, wait a minute, on this date and this date, you said this. If you convert it, God can wipe it out. Amen? <laughs> if you repent it and, and convert it, God says, you know what, I'm not going to let them see that, you know? The National Security Agency has been collecting phone records of millions of U.S. Verizon customers on their top secret court order, according to published reports. It's the same thing again. There's a top, a top secret system called PRISM, uh, which allows the NSA to directly access the servers of numerous online services and to obtain all kinds of information about its users on the Internet. And this talk, it goes by where they can collect, collect they, this is what it says, collect directly from the servers of these U.S. service providers, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, PowerTalk, AOL, Skype, YouTube, Apple. Everybody. Where are you going to run to?
These, I'm going to go back to that, to that right there. The Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, has challenged researchers to build micro aerial vehicles, M M MAVs, that hide in plain sight by mimicking the size and behavior of bugs and birds. So you have a bug in your house, or a bird, you think it's a bug or a bird, and it's actually a drone. Not only this, I've seen where the Air Force have, they've, they've, they've already developed. You think it's like little mosquitoes, but they're actually drones, and they can actually commit assassination with them. So you think there's a bird out there, and they, and they have technology, they, some of these technology, they can see it right through your walls. So understand, this is not meant to scare you. Amen? I got to close out. I'm going longer than I'm supposed to. So as we close out, understand, although all of this is happening, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We can't, be, we can't ignore this because the prophet tells us that people need to understand what's happening. But we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. The book of Revelation says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yet we see what's happening. He tells us what's going to happen. And so he's meant to tell us to draw closer to Jesus. Pray more. Spend more time in the word. Family devotion, all of that. The church needs to press together, press together, press together. Amen? Some of us are going to die. That's okay. As long as I'm in Christ, it don't matter. Amen? And so, finally, when he finally said, brace for impact, that's when everyone started realizing we were crashing. It was really very quiet. People praying to themselves. I was watching other people, seeing if they were bracing, how they were bracing, looking at my seatmate, talking to him, trying to get an idea of what was happening. Then you heard the fear in the stewardess's mouth, repeating, head down, brace for impact. They knew it wasn't good. It was not a moment of peace or my life flashing before my eyes. It was how quickly can I pray? It was forgive me for all my sins. I don't have time to go through all of them right now. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, but you just gotta have, you just gonna have to take this blanket, uh, this blank, this, take this blanket under my circumstances. Then for my family and my husband, one by one, they would, that they would recover from this loss. You know, you ever notice when death is coming, how everything else now doesn't seem important? You could hear, pull up, pull up, terrain, terrain, and that was frightening. So they could hear from the cockpit telling, telling the, uh, the, the, uh, the captain, pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up. Then the captain landed the plane on the water. You notice it looked like they're standing on the sea? That's why, the, that's why, the, that's why the, the scripture reading was from Revelation 15. They stand on the sea of glass. Those that are overcome, the beast, the image, you understand what I'm saying, right? I, I want to read that in closing. You notice, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. Amen? Amen. And Revelation 15, it tells us and I saw as it were man, this lightning is bad in here and my words are so small. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten a victory over the what? The bees? And over what? Image. Image and over what? His mark and, where the, and over what? The number of his name. And what happened? They sat on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb, the law and the testimony of Moses and the Lamb. The, the law and the testimony, amen? And then what does it say? Great and marvelous are thy works. Who's the God of the Sabbath? Which, which commandment shows who created everything? So they recognized the God of the Sabbath. They were worshipers of the God of the Sabbath. Great and wondrous of thy works, but even deeper than that, great and marvelous are your works in my heart. Y'all don't hear me though. Great and marvelous are your works in creation. But they can sing to God because they overcame. So they say, 
and you help me overcome, so great and marvelous are your works in my heart. Amen. Who is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. They can sing that song. Amen? Amen. And then he says, just and true are thy ways. Thou king of saints. Is he your king? They can say he's their king. They can say the king of saints because he's their king. Father in heaven, you are great and greatly to be praised. And this my soul knoweth right well. Thank you for the privilege to speak to your people. You know great that I'm unworthy. I ask that you would forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. If there's anyone in here now that has not made a decision for Jesus, I'm going to ask that you would do so now. If you haven't made a decision for Jesus, and you haven't done so, this is your opportunity to make that decision. Just raise your hand. For those of us who want to overcome, who know we have defects of our character, who have things in us that need to be overcome, we're suffering or struggling with them. Father, we all have both uh, inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil. We pray for a will that's willing to be made willing. We pray, Lord God, that you allow no sin to have dominion over us. I ask a special prayer for everyone that's in here and the families that they represent. Anything that I've said has been key to not you. Wipe it from the minds of your people, I pray. Is there anyone here before I close out that has not made a decision for Jesus that wants to do so now? Father, we need your Holy Spirit. We know partly of what's coming, and that which I've been able to present, that's not even sufficient to show what, how bad it really is. Help us, Lord. Thank you for hearing and answering these prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.